Good morning. Today, I would like to tell you something about a project that um, I'm doing, uh, getting funded by SONMW. Um, I'm doing this work together with Professor Kundemann and also with uh, Giulio Giusterini, who is a postdoc working on a project, performing actually all of the experiments. <clears throat> so hopefully, you can actually see his picture uh, soon. And what I want to tell you about, uh, what we're interested in, so indeed here is Giulio, what we are together interested in is how immune cells deal with microplastics. And why do we think that this is an important question? So in order for you to understand that, I need to give you a little bit of background on our immune cells and um, on what they normally do in our bodies. So what if you have a wound? If you have a wound, sometimes bacteria can penetrate this wound, and these bacteria need to be taken care of, attacked by your immune system in order to not get an infection. So here we can see the bacteria entering the wound, and what now happens? What now does our immune system do to attack these, um, these bacteria? So what I have here is an intravital microscopy picture. That sounds a little bit complicated, but what it is is a living mouse under anesthesia under our microscope. And that way, we can visualize in this living mouse how immune cells are dealing with bacteria in this case. So in blue here, you can see the tissue of the ear of the mouse, because I injected the bacteria in the ear. And in red, you can see the bacteria. And in green, the immune cells. So what you can see when I start playing this movie is the immune cells starting to attack the bacteria. <clears throat> I'll play this movie, it's about half an hour in real life, but I'll play it a little bit faster for you now. So this is what happens. Your immune cells in green are really swarming to these bacteria in order to contain them. If we now zoom in on this process a little bit more, you can see that these immune cells actually are like pac mans and that they can engulf the bacteria and take them along. <clears throat> so if you can look at the, at the top uh, particle, I will uh, play it one more time. At the top, you can see the red bacteria being engulfed by the immune cell, and then all of them are being recruited uh, to bigger colonies of bacteria, after which these immune cells can degrade these bacteria. But what now happens if in our bodies we have microplastics? So researchers before have already shown that if you orally administer microplastics to mice, that these can end up in different organs. So here you can see that they end up in the liver, the kidney, and the gut. And to me, it was a surprise that even the 20 micrometer microplastics ended up here. And to you, I think 20 micrometer doesn't say a lot, but to me, it's, it's, about, it's actually bigger um, than a normal cell in your body. So that means that even microparticles that are bigger than your cells are able to penetrate your body and enter the organs. So this really prompted us to ask the question, what now if immune cells are encountering microplastics rather than bacteria? Will they also start to engulf them? Will they degrade them? Which, of course, they actually cannot. So how do they deal with that? Do they try to attack them, but they cannot? So this is what we wanted to investigate. And in order to do this, what we did is we isolated um, blood cells from humans, uh, from human volunteers. We put them in a culture dish, and then we put them together with two types of, uh, with actually four types of microplastics. So we chose to look at two sizes, the one micrometer and the 10 micrometers. The one micrometer is about the size of a bacteria, and the 10 micrometer is slightly smaller than a cell. But then in addition to looking at clean microplastics, we wanted to look at another situation, because normally, actually, microplastics are not clean. They tend to stick to many things. So we, are, we were thinking that if we would encounter microplastics in our body, it's much more likely that blood components will start sticking to these microplastics and perhaps changing how your immune cells are dealing with them. So we also thought it was important to not only look at the clean microplastics, but to also look at the microplastics that had these sticky blood components added to them. So this is what we did. And here you can see a microscopy picture. Now in gray are the immune cells, and in green are the microplastics. These are the bigger beads. They're about the same size as the cells are. And what we can see in the uncoated or the clean microplastics, 
that the immune cells bump into these microplastics, but they're not engulfing, engulfing them like they do with bacteria. But then, <clears throat> if, we, if we have the microplastics that are coated with the blood components, we see a very different picture. We can see here at the bottom, that, um, and also in some other cases, that now these microplastics are being engulfed by immune cells. <clears throat> but what was even more troubling is that we could say the cells dying, and that you can see in this movie with a red signal. So you can see gradually in this movie, also the cell there at the bottom that had engulfed the microplastic is now starting to die and flashing this red signal of death. So that was worrying to us. <clears throat> then if we compare that to the smaller microplastics of one micrometer, about the size of a bacteria, we found that also they were being engulfed by the immune cells, but in this case, we couldn't detect the death signal. So it seemed like really the bigger microplastics uh, were giving a bigger impact. We also uh, did the same experiment, uh, well, actually, with another experimental setup, but at least to also see if we could find this increased cell death in a different method. And indeed, what you can see here is in the black line, immune cells only. So this is how long a normal immune cell lives. We have on the x-axis, on the horizontal axis, we have the time, and on the uh, vertical axis, we have the amount of cell death. So if we focus on, for instance, the 20-hour time point, you can see that immune cells only have hardly died, but in case of the 10-micrometer blood plasma coated uh, line, you can see that many of the immune cells had already died. So what did I tell you today? I showed that if a microplastic is clean, not covered, that it's being ignored by immune cells, and that if it's covered in blood proteins, that now they can be recognized by immune cells, and that in the case of the bigger microplastic, uh, this causes it to die. And we've only been working on this project for four months, so there's really a lot of work to be done. Uh, and the things that we first want to do is to look at particles that actually are there in the environment. So we, um, Dick provides us with samples, Dick Fetak, um, that actually have been exposed to UV light and to seawater to better mimic the environmental plastics because that sort of erodes their surface and can really change how an immune cell is dealing with them. And also, I already mentioned before, we want to see different shapes, not only spheres. In addition, I think it's a very important next step to look in these uh, mice, again under anesthesia, under the microscope, to see if in a real living animal also this microplastic is coming together with an immune cell. Because now we've looked at it in a culture dish, and we are not really sure if this would happen in a real-life situation. Therefore, I think it's key to orally administer microplastics to mice, see if they arrive in the blood, and see if they arrive in organs, and also visualize how the immune cells are now dealing with these microplastics in the body. In addition, we got some extra funding <coughs> to work together with Freika Riese and Leron at the VU, uh, where we are now adopting uh, one of their methods where they have uh, measured silicon in tissue to see if we can measure microplastics in human tissue biopsies. So I'm also very excited to pursue that. So thank you for your attention.